this camera here? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Alex Curtis, and some people may know me as Kurt Nasty. Good? Got it? Sounds good. Alex, would you say that the allegations are true, that you were a ring chaser? Um, Alex has dedicated himself to the green and gold like I haven't seen in another chamois in many years. Uh, I think he's an absolute coward. I think his injury is bush league and he is a fraud. Every day he'd come in screaming at everyone, no matter what they were doing, he would just be losing his mind. We used to be firing shots. He used to ask us if we were pitchers and shit. Over there. He wore, he wore that uh, wore that jersey on his back uh, very proudly. When we heard the news, it was almost heartbreaking. You know, it's, I fought back tears as I'm doing now, and uh, I honestly don't know how we're gonna go on without him. Just, I don't know. lay the jersey there for the last time and I knew I'd never put it on again and uh, that, that was a pretty emotional moment for me you know it, uh, it really hit home that that was the last time I'll wear it uh, in high school dodgeball You know, before I was ever hurt nasty or that like persona, I was just, you know, a normal guy who just loved sports and competition. And I think that's really where the Kurt Nasty persona kinda came from. So can you remember at all how the Kurt Nasty name came to be? Uh no, I honestly don't remember, but um it was definitely me making fun of him and it clearly stuck to him, so he is now Kurt Nasty. You know, not many people realize I actually um, didn't come up with Kurt Nasty myself. It was actually um, Devin O'Keefe, you know, way back when, grade 10. and It's kind of crazy to me how much it's grown over the years. So, Graham, what was Alex Curtis like before Kurt Nasty? Mm -hmm. I mean, he was always weird. He had a great relationship with Val. Like, in grade 10, I started going to the gym, like, every lunchtime with Chris. Just get super sweaty. And that's when he started the Kurt Nasty. And how did you come to be a part of this Kurt Nasty legacy? Well, Alex approached me because we had English class with uh, Mr. Goss, who was a total beauty. But that's when he really opened up about his plans for the future. And he really shared his vision with me. And that's when we really got started on the Kurt Nasty vision. Uh, and then later, Dev introduced it. And from there, well, now you know, Kurt Nasty. Uh, the dodgeball team actually uh, surprisingly do a lot. I never came up with that either. Uh, Devin O'Keefe kind of first saw a couple of the team members in, a, in some local gym time and really in grade 10 it wasn't even my passion at that point. It was just kind of something to do. Uh, it was pretty easy actually. Uh, we selected the three baseball guys and Graham, Alex, and Bucky. And then, uh, you know, Mike Lunger can obviously catch a ball. And uh, Jack was more so just there for numbers, standing in the back. I, I think we gelled from day one. I think just the group that myself and Devin O'Keefe brought in really fit. So how were you recruited to the Kurt Nasty team? Well, they came up and asked me and I decided to play because I was a pretty standout player in gym class and uh, I had nothing else to do during lunch so just picked to do that. Yeah, you know, grade 10, um, I thought we were a pretty good team, not as good as we were in the later years, but we um, we were looking pretty good going into the playoffs. And I mean that quarterfinal game, uh, I'll be honest, I choked, I went out pretty early. But I mean, what Liam Buckingham did there is nothing short of amazing. And I think you saw that in his passion when he you know destroyed the paper towel dispenser after the game in celebration. I think that said a lot about our team, what it meant to us. 
you know, that was pretty big. It was one of the more defining moments of my high school dodgeball career. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. So moving on to the grade 10 final, would you say that is the lowest point in your career? I would, yes. Um, I think this is definitely an eye-opener for me, and I think that's really when it transformed from a hobby, a hobby to a lifestyle for me. Um, it, it broke my heart. You know, we go in there, uh, we're already down Mike Lundgren because he had to pick his brother up at the airport, don't get me started. Really emotional and heated moment between me and him there, and then, you know, Devin's playing through with a broken hand, but, you know, we can make excuses all we want. I, I choked. Plain and simple. The final? Man, we came off a huge game because we played we played a bunch of great twelves in the semifinal, I think. And that was when it was really hyped. We were on the line and we all dove for the starting ball, I remember. And it was it got kind of fucked because Mike like went over the line and there was a whole shebang because we went over like the center line and Maddie Brown got fucking pissed, I think. And there's a bunch of shit. And then Joel Power got pissed at me because I slid into him and like cracked his tooth and he gave me the finger from across the field. I was like, oh, what the fuck? And then we started throwing dodgeballs. And the grade nasty became pretty nasty. Yeah, grade 10 final, uh, Alex choked pretty hard. I actually had a broken hand and I was the last one left in both the games. So uh, we'll blame that one on Alex. It didn't impact me until we got into the locker room when Curtis started speaking. And then things got different. Do you remember what he said? He spoke to each member of the team. I think we were all a bit uplifted, maybe a bit heavy hearted. But then we went back to English class and it was all the same. And then next year, that's when we really started to ramp it up. I think going into grade 11, there was a lot of pressure on uh, not only myself, but the team. Um, you know, we felt like we should have won last year, and the pressure was on to win a championship. And um, a lot of people said I was a fluke, you know, one year wonder, and I took that personally. So you're moving on from grade 10 into grade 11. You're in the next year's final. Mm -hmm. Did you notice any kind of change in Alex in between those years? I would say some some switched. You could say he took it personal. You could say he was chasing after something, but really he was just becoming the next big thing. It's great little. All right, so what led to you releasing Jack and picking up Murray? Um, it was definitely a tough decision. I mean, Jack was, you know, a close personal friend of ours, but um, at the end of the day, we, um, we lost the previous year. We felt changes had to be made. And in doing so, you know, we had our eyes on Murray, you know, a good athlete who we thought could help our team, and we went out and did. He was happy to be a part of the team. Yeah, we lost Jack. Uh, he can obviously catch a ball. He can throw one arguably better than Alex. But uh, Murray's cool too. He did his job. Uh, Corn, he's a, he's, a, he's a friend of ours, and uh, he wanted to be on the team, be part of the dynasty, but uh, I guess Alex didn't feel uh, we needed his presence on the team. So. Uh, he decided to make his own team come up against us. So what are your thoughts on Daniel Corn Penny? Corn um, was someone, uh, kind of a fan uh, of the Kurt Nasty brand in grade 10 and grade 11. And uh, in grade 12, he approached us asking you know, for a spot on the team. Um, I felt fully confident in our team's ability to repeat, and I didn't want to pick him up. And um, I don't think he uh, uh, liked that definitely seem to fire him up a bit. You want to know one of the advantages are to choking in a dodgeball final? There's a fuck ton of negatives. There's one positive. Anyone. 
The one positive is it gives you a taste of what it's like to almost be a champion. We were right there last year, and it got ripped away. There's no doubt in my mind. We have enough fucking talent in this room. Look who's in this room right now. We're fucking talented. The question is, do we want it? I'm fucking stupid. Fuck! So we gotta go out there and act like we want. They're not gonna fucking give it to us. <laughs> we just gotta fucking want it. I'm fucking hungry. <laughs> that's, that's all for me. That's it. Yeah, so, uh, that speech was definitely something. I think it set the tone for the year. So, yeah, obviously there was a lot of heartbreak in that uh, pregame speech from the from the heartbreaker uh, the year before in the finals and uh, really got the boys going. Well, that was uh, an interesting speech. I don't know how long Curtis spent the night before writing that up, but uh, a lot of vulgarity as well, so that was interesting. Get fired up, though. Good laugh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, that speech was um, from the heart, you know, I, I didn't really rehearse it, uh, the, I just kind of knew I wanted to hype the boys up before the year started, give them a speech, and that's what I came up with. Boys, you know, let, let's be real here for a second, we've, uh, we've had a successful two years, you know, grade 10, obviously not the ideal finish, we didn't lose the game until the finals, last year, of course, we finally brought it home. I think everyone should be happy uh, with that. Um, but coming into this year, you know, it's our last year. Uh, we got a legacy to live up to. And to be honest with you, we're not getting the respect we deserve. There are too many teams coming out here saying, oh yeah, fuck you, Curtis. We're going to destroy you guys. I don't know about you guys, but it's about time we earned some goddamn respect in here. We got a lot of fucking talent once again in this room. And I'm sick and tired of people not thinking we're the best team. We got a two-time MVP, we got a fucking champ over there in the corner, Mike is fucking jacked, fucking fucking sick, Murray's a goddamn monster, and I've never seen anyone throw their body around like fucking Devin O'Keefe. <laughs> yeah, that speech was a bit different from the previous year, but uh, it was still good and got the boys going. Yeah, funny uh, chemistry there in the locker room. Cause it, I mean, like it's hype, but it was also a joke. Cause like it was weird, <laughs> like who does that? But yeah, it's a good time. So Alex, how long did you stay up making that speech? Cause it was pretty thought out. I mean, you know, it resembled my passion. I think I was up till around four or five a.m. that morning, really, uh, well that whole night, just thinking of how can I motivate these guys to want to win another championship, and. Um, you know, that, that was the goal. Uh, I felt like that year I had prepared myself, this is make or break for my legacy. And I felt that pressure. the grade 12 final and coming into it you know I, I felt like the boys were ready um, we were coming up against corn who really I, I didn't see him as a threat but um you know a lot of people including himself were trying to talk trash and you know we're gonna win and you know I took that personally and I felt like we were gonna go in there and win obviously and then we go out game one not our best performance kind of a mediocre performance that we lose I you know game two probably not my finest moment you know, um, and, and honestly, in that moment, I thought, maybe, maybe it's over, you know, going out 30 seconds early, and I was worried. But did you cry? No, I didn't cry. You know, a lot of people think I did. Uh, I was upset, obviously. No, I didn't cry. Yeah, he definitely cried. Yeah, I wasn't even there for that game, but uh, I heard he definitely cried. 100% cried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he cried. Yeah, he definitely cried. He cried. Oh, yeah, like a baby. I didn't even go to Gonzaga. I know he cried. I was sitting on the bench. I honestly thought it was over. I was looking out there. We were already down, obviously, Devin. I was like, is this the end? Did we really, Did I really choke this? And uh, But to this day, it haunts me almost looking at what Graham King did, how he dug that deep and just kind of awakened something in himself and just he went off. It was scary to watch. 
And then obviously Liam Buckingham, as he so frequently did, kind of clutched it up at the end for us in the one-on-one, -on -one and the rest history. And then it comes down to that faded game three, which could have been one of the best of my career. It's a big moment for me. I just trusted in the work I'd put in and was like, all right, let, let's win this. Let's pull this home. And, you know, I'm forever fortunate that we did. I still, I don't even remember what the celebration was. I kind of blacked out. But, um, I mean, just what a moment. And one of the finest. And just huge for the team. Yeah, um, I actually stayed behind after the grade 12 win, kind of soak it all in, lay the jersey there for the last time, and I knew I'd never put it on again. And uh, that, that was a pretty emotional moment for me, you know, it, uh, it really hit home and that was the last time I'll wear it uh, in high school basketball. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty ridiculous. The teachers were yelling at them to get out of the girls' bathroom and go to class, so you probably should have packed it up then. We all got a good kick of uh, Alex running around like an idiot, especially with that dodgeball trophy. It looked, uh, looked pretty, uh, pretty retarded. Can I say that word? <laughs> yeah, I think we're gonna have Yeah, nasty hoop talk. Uh, it was kind of an idea. Just kind of, kind of. You know, I'd always loved basketball, and I had that passion to, to kind of watch it and really uh, analyze the game on, on a deeper level. Uh, and that's kind of where nasty hoop talk kind of evolved from. I was like, you know, what's stopping me from creating an Instagram page with 250 followers that people DM me about half frequently to talk the NBA? Nothing's stopping me. When did Alex first tell you about Nasty Hoop Talk? He introduced the idea before grade 12. Uh, he kind of sprinkled it in through a DM once we were chatting. Uh, and I told him, like, hey, like, this won't work. <laughs> like, don't do it. But he did it, and I said, you won't do it till, like, probably won't be doing it after Christmas. And now here we are, like, two years later. So good on him. He's making a fucking movie. So. What do you think is the best part about Nasty Hoop Talk? Um, I'd have to say uh, the relationship I have with the fans. Uh, you know, I often feel, you know, they feel free to DM me, you know, thoughts on this, you know, and I think I'm starting to earn the respect as uh, someone that people know understands the game of uh, basketball. You know, I remember when Kawhi Leonard was free agent and he went to the Clippers, everyone was wondering where he was going to go. I'd show up to like the baseball field and people would be like, hey, where's Kawhi going? I'd be like, well, I don't really know, guys. And they'd be like shocked, like, what do you mean you don't know? I'm like, guys, I'm just a normal dude from Newfoundland who runs a semi-popular Instagram page. I don't know where Kawhi's going, right? But, you know, people kind of thought, like, this guy's an expert. They expected me to know. Yeah, I mean, that does happen. I've seen it. But, like, at the same time, the people are asking him are, like, also, like, called Burger shit like that, so I don't know about that. Oh my god, dude, what was that takedown at the Technoplay? Oh my god, okay, I got one. After LeBron left Cleveland, Alex Curtis goes on Kurt Nassie and puts up a video, and Cleveland's roster is in absolute shambles, folks. And he goes up on Kurt Nassie and says, don't sleep on Cleveland, they're gonna have a good season. Cleveland might have won 20 games that season. Terrible take, great guy, terrible take. You know, I think a lot of people saw me as a dodgeball player, and they saw, you know, maybe an arrogant individual who, who that's who's doing what he loves. But in reality, baseball was my true love, and uh, I mean, I put my life into it. So, when did Alex disclose to you 
that he wanted a trade? Uh, I didn't actually hear from Alex. I got a few calls. One from the Generals, one from the Storm. Uh, and then one from a few guys on Holy Cross asked me, you know, where's Alex going to go? Because he was kind of up in the air for a while. Uh, and everybody knew the potential that was there. I think we were all just kind of waiting for it to explode. Alex, would you say that the allegations are true? That you were a ring chaser? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, that's probably uh, a term I may have to live my whole life going with. Uh, unfortunately, just based on you know who I was traded from and who I went to, but at the end of the day, I, I don't feel it came down to their ability to win a championship. Yeah, it was more so I liked the group of guys they had on that team, and I wanted to be a part of it. And, and uh, I, you know, I still love my uh, former brethren at the Fieldians. I tried to make sure that it wasn't taken personally. But uh, you know, it's business. The first time that you played the Fieldians as a member of the Shams, can you walk us through that experience? Uh, I'm mean, incredibly emotional. You know, showed up to the ballpark, realized kind of like, wow, like I'm not on their team anymore. And I mean, obviously, you know, I showed respect after my first hit against the former club, and you know, that was that. But uh, yeah, just a lot of emotions. Really. Me and Alex had some discussions in the off season of 2019. Some under the table talks, nothing serious. We don't have management labels. We don't have anything, just player to player. We discussed it because we were thinning out on arms and we know Alex is one of the better pitchers in the league. You watch him pitch, he does not look like one of the better pitchers in the league, but he is effective. On top of him being a great pitcher, he could hit. He randomly hit once again. You watch him, doesn't look like a good hitter, but he can hit. Won the MVP this year, <laughs> not a big deal, but he took it with him. He's been a great addition, and it's uh, it's been a lot of help for our team. So how much do you think baseball means to Alex? Some may say too much, but too much isn't in Alex's vocabulary. Alex has dedicated himself to the green and gold like I haven't seen in another chamois in many years. He shows up to the games an hour and a half before, first car in the parking lot, goes, gets the tee in the cage. It doesn't help him. I still don't think it helps him. I don't think it does anything for him. If you look at his hits and where his hits are, they are considered garbage hits. They don't ask how, they ask how many. And that's what Alex Curtis is. We tend to call Alex the uh, AC unit. He tends to be able to bring the fire and heat it up, but when he needs to, he can cool it back down. So Alex, how did you originally come up with the idea to start a men's league team? Uh, you know, I don't know if it was uh, really mine. Um, you know, uh, me and a close group of friends uh, involving Julian Breen Dillon, Jordan Heptich, Josh Hescock, Mike Lundrigan, and uh, Jacob Ryan, to name a few names. Um, we had known and said pretty early on high school that after high school we, we wanted to be a men's league team. And, you know, once we graduated, it became pretty clear that it was going to be important for me to take a leadership role on that team and kind of maybe take the responsibility of getting it formed. And, um, yeah, that's really where it all kind of began. So how did Alex approach you to join the men's league team? Uh, emails, phone calls, by mail, Instagram DMs, Snapchat, blue message, videos, and pictures. Uh, he presented contracts and other incentives and obligations that he would have to fulfill, uh, but they weren't too attractive for me at the time. It took something else. Yeah, you know, Graham was uh, definitely a player we had our eyes on pretty um, pretty early on in that process. Um, we kind of realized uh, it, if we were going to make a men's league basketball team, you need that Kurt Nasty winning experience. And, uh, you know, Graham had proven he's a winner. Um, and he's actually the only man who ever turned me down. You know, uh, uh, it took a lot of convincing to get him to play on that team, and in the end, I think it worked out for both parties. You know, if I'm being honest, uh, after grade 12, I wasn't sure if I was going to keep playing basketball. You know, I had a few tough years before grade 12, and uh, Alex approached me and after our senior B season. I had a career year that year, and uh, he approached me just wondering if I was interested in keep playing, and I was just like, you know what, I had a great year. I'm looking forward to, you know, keep going with that and I knew Alex had the, all the skills and abilities to lead our team to success. That's all it is. 
So how did Alex recruit you for the men's league Kurt Nasty team? Um, he was just looking for a big man, good defensively, get rebounds, uh, pass the ball on offense, and uh, just be a glue guy, you know, have fun out there. Uh, I think he saw my performance at the uh, at the inaugural Curtis Cup and uh, noticed that I was lacking on teammate performance and saw my potential as a player on the team. Uh, actually, I, uh, I believe it happened probably two or three weeks before the season started. Um, we happened to be at Mon together, and uh, so I, I was at the wa I was just using the washroom, and uh, I heard the door open, just a creak behind me. So uh, you know, never thought too much of it. And uh, then I see Alex. He's probably five urinals to the left of me, and uh, so you know, ten seconds pass. So I look over, four urinals to the left of me. Stream still going. Don't know how it's happening. I look over, 20 seconds later, he's right next to me. I'm like, oh my god, this is weird. And uh, anyway, so then he pops the question, do you want to play on my men's league team? And I was, I was a bit, you know, a bit, a bit weirded out at that point, so I, uh, I ended up saying yes, and uh, we haven't looked back since. So how would you describe your role within the organization of the Kurt Nasty men's league team? Uh, you know, I think it's fair to say, I mean, obviously, you know, the owner, GM, coach, captain, slash player, um, as I jokingly said, but I knew pretty early on I was probably going to have to step up, take a leadership role with the team, uh, but a much different one than I was used to in the dodgeball years. You know, there I was kind of a star player, lead by example. I knew pretty early on I wasn't going to be a star player that would lead, lead by example, sorry, and um, yeah, I think it was more so just kind of being more of a coach, kind of getting the boys locked in one goal. And what is that goal? To win championships. So how was Alex as the owner, player, coach, GM, etc.? Uh, you know, uh, he was good. Yeah, I was the first one to go pick someone up if they fell. And the coaching aspect was really good. He would sit him out for the last couple minutes of the game and play the players who actually should have been out there. So that was good and respectable. Um, obviously, he had a lot of uh, stress on his shoulders leading the team and uh, all the behind the scenes work that went into that, including his r roster sheets that he was uh, doing the night before and game plans. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, he was pretty solid at his roles. Alex as a commissioner is a couple ways you can describe it. He was, uh, out of three years, you could tell he had an outstanding amount of passion for all sports involved. Every day he'd come in screaming at everyone, no matter what they were doing, he would just be losing his mind. And every time we'd ref a game and he got called out, screams, tantrums, fully just freaked out. I can still hear him freaking out in my head to this day. You know, we were in a pretty tough spot of the year. We went into a game with only like six players. You know, Julian slept in, unfortunately wasn't there. Mike fouled out pretty early on in the third quarter, and then you know Colin goes down with that tragic injury, and we think this might be it for this game. I mean, four players left, but I mean, when he came back through the injury to that standing ovation, turning point for your, for the year, really, just him showing that resilience and that desire. I mean, that was incredible. Yeah, you know, it was a bit of an innocent play. Came down, went knee on knee with someone. Wasn't really that hurt. Kind of overplayed a bit. I knew the Steelers were on a pretty serious third down in the fourth quarter, so I had to go watch it on my phone on the bench for a bit. But once that ended, I uh, went back and forth with a bit of a limp, you know, sell it a bit. But uh, yeah, felt like I got some recognition that I didn't deserve, but you know, it is what it is. So Colin McKinnon and Regan Seymour cleared almost all of the awards at the Curdies. Can you describe their role and impact on the team? Um, you know, to be honest, when I first signed them, I didn't expect them to be kind of, they, they kind of turned out to be two of our better players and definitely guys who were stuff on the stat sheet every night. I, I didn't imagine that at the start, but they, I mean, they stepped up from game one. Uh, obviously, you know, they kind of beef with each other and they're kind of terrible teammates who fight a lot. But I mean, you know, when I could get them on the same page, uh, they did great things for the team and uh, they deserved all the awards I got. Uh, I thought it was a great, great event. Uh, you know, it was put off professionally. You know, well as professional as it gets, it was held in the shed. Um, but you know, uh, free beer was provided uh, by our manager, GM, coach, captain, Alex Curtis. Um, you know, I thought uh, you know it was nice to come away with a couple of awards. But uh, you know, I would never be able to do any of it without my teammates, my coach. Um, you know. I think, uh, you know, a couple people got robbed on a couple of awards. I thought, you know, shoot, 
for one, probably, you know, should have won a couple of awards, you know, best offensive player, best defensive player, best player, best free throw shooter, best three point percentage, you know, a uh, couple of those. But overall, I thought it was a, uh, a you know, a strong, a strong performance from Alex on uh, the presentation of the Curtis. In the eyes of our leader, it was a prestigious ceremony, but in the eyes of the rest of us, it was just a place to drink. You know, he got us a case of beer. We had a good time, and uh, yeah, it's a great way to end the year. Now, there was one teammate that we interviewed here that didn't have nice words to say about you, uh, Colin McKinnon. He feels he was robbed of the MVP. What do you say to that? Uh, you know, in my mind, it's all noise. You know, it's all, it's going around, you know. I, uh, I don't put too much weight in it, you know, if you, uh, if you focus on the negatives, you'll never see the positive, right? So, uh, you know, I would, uh, you know, on, on that topic, I would never discredit any work of my teammates. Yeah, I was uh, fairly satisfied with the award of most field goals made. Felt like it was well-deserving. I mean, statistical category, but that's all you can do. But, uh, yeah, fucking Seymour stole that MVP for me, and there's no doubt about it. People might say otherwise, but I know my heart tells my award. You know, he never won, so uh, he can keep talking about it, but, you know, it's all noise. It's all just exterior noise to me. So why did you cut or refuse to choose Paul Brun Newhook for your senior men's league team? Um, I, you, know, you know Paul was a close friend of mine and a, and a hell of a basketball player. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, you know, um, I went out and started picking players and... We got down to it, we had a full team, he was there, and you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of factors to take into uh, into the question uh, that you've asked, but um, you, you know, there's just a lot of things going on. So Paul, what was your experience with Alex Curtis? Uh, I mean, it's kind of a touchy subject for me. Um, he was like a brother to me, one of my closest friends, and then I found out that he didn't select me for the uh, men's league team. And uh, I felt betrayed, heartbroken. Uh, you know, Paul obviously had played with us in the past in the Crow Nasty brand, and that was something we valued a lot, and his, his time was definitely uh, respected and appreciated. But um, things happen, right? So, Paul, I see you brought your, uh, your old jersey here. How much did it mean for you to play for the Crow Nasty organization? I mean, here it is. I wore this in. Uh, grade 12 when he selected me for the first time and honestly he meant the world to me. I never thought he'd uh, pick me but he did and it meant everything. It was I'm sorry I, I can't do this. So when we had Paul in the studio earlier he was borderline in tears over being cut from the organization. How do you feel about this? I mean, I think it just speaks to what it means to play for the club. I mean, it's an honor for every player that, that you know is lucky enough to be selected and get to step on that court every single day. And I, uh, I met the criteria to be selected, but I wasn't. Alex, would it be fair to say that the season being canceled has caused you to become depressed? Um. It, it definitely took a toll. Um, I um, I did some things I wasn't really proud of in reaction to it. Um, you know, you just work so hard all year, and you're really looking forward to you know that opportunity to just win a championship and to have you know a third party rip that away from you. It stinks. So how did Alex react to the men's league season being canceled due to COVID-19? Uh, he took it rough. He needed something to soothe himself, I would say. Uh, and he found the answer with a podcast. You know, getting Shoop in for a good uh, hour and a half of discussion, I think, really eased the pain. Uh, and now he's just kind of on his way back. You know, it's, um, when we heard the news, it was almost heartbreaking. You know, it's, I fought back tears as I'm doing now, and uh, I honestly don't know how we're kidding. Go on without him.
So Alex, as we wrap up production, what is next for you? Um, you know, um, I think the most important thing is just to realize that it's not done yet. The, the, the dream, the goals I have, obviously, you know, there's been some great days that are, that are gone and that are finished and that I've enjoyed. But um, it's about looking ahead to the future. Now it's all about, you know, recovering from this uh, tragic injury um, and just trying to get back to my best self. But uh, and then it's just all about just continuing to motivate myself to grind. Just every day, week in, week out, next year, two years, finding a way to just seek perfection. That quest to forge a legacy in the new world and continue to take my brand to the next level. And um, I'm just really, really excited to do that. All right. Good. Oh, Mother wasn't sick, or that we would just come up on some stacks and hit a lick. And I wish my homies wouldn't have to suffer when the streets get the upper hand on us and we lose a brother. And I wish I could go deep in the zone and lift the spirits of the world with the words within the song. And I wish I could teach a soul to fly, take away the pain out your hands and help you hold them high. And I wish my homie Butch was still alive and on the day of his death, we had never took that ride. And I wish that God could protect us from the wrong so that all the soldiers that were sent overseas come home. And uh, we will never break, though they devastate. We shall motivate, and we gotta pray. All we gotta spay. Instead of thinking about who gon' die today, the Lord is gon' help you feel better, so you ain't gotta cry today. Sit at the light so long, and then we gotta move straight forward, cause we fight so strong. So when right go wrong, just say a little prayer, get your money, man. Right goes Though on. I'm hopeful, yes I am. Hopeful for today. Take this music and use it to make You can show some love Instead of hating so much When you see some other people coming up I wish I could teach the world to sing Write some music and have them tripping off the joy I bring I wish that we can hold hands Listen instead of dissing lessons from a grown man And I wish the families that lack But got love Get some stacks Brand new shack in the lack That's on dubs And I wish we could keep achieving wonders See the vision of the world Through the eyes of Stevie Wonder You feel me? And I hope all the kids eat And don't nobody in my family See six feet You dig? I hope the mother stands strong You can make it whether you with them Or your mask on